This is a good friend of mine's field, and he's doing the same thing I'm doing, growing corn, right, for harvest. He's just doing it a lot differently. You've got the contrast of the, the soil versus the corn. You've got the beautiful rows uh, straight down. This is what I envisioned when I was a kid of doing when I was older, is farming just like this. And when you get into regenerative ag, you've got chaos. On Trey Hill's farm in Maryland, the fields look a lot different than the clean, orderly rows of crops that his friend is growing. Unlike his friend, who tills his fields after fall harvest and leaves them barren for the winter, Hill plants rye, turnips, clover, and a few other species of plants in the off-season so that his fields stay covered year-round. Known as cover cropping, this practice is just one piece of a movement called regenerative farming. The approach focuses on replenishing the soil's nutrients and also includes things like no-till cultivation, rotational cattle grazing, and using less synthetic fertilizers. What we do is after we harvest our corn or our soybeans in the fall, we plant a subsequent crop called a cover crop. And that's what we're standing in right now. But then when we go to plant corn, uh, our planters will go right directly through this and put the seeds in the ground in the middle of all of the, these flowers. And then we'll spray the, the cover crop off and it'll die and decompose into the ground and the corn will come up through it. As the cover crops grow and eventually decompose, they provide nutrients for microbes and improve the soil's health. At the same time, the plants pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil. Globally, about 25% of our climate change pollution is caused by food and agriculture. Most of that's because we're deforesting places like the Amazon to create more farmland but also the methane that comes out of our cattle and rice fields is also contributing to climate change, as is the overuse of fertilizers and other things. But regenerative agriculture seeks to reverse that and not only kind of cut down the pollution, but maybe in some cases even soak up some of the pollution we put in the atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide. Driven by climate conscious consumers, a number of massive corporations, including General Mills and PepsiCo, are vowing to scale regenerative practices across millions of acres of farmland. But can it help tackle climate change? For the last five years, Hills planted year-round cover crops and refrained from tilling the soil, which prevents the trapped carbon that he's worked hard to sequester from escaping back into the atmosphere. He says his yields are comparable to what he would have gotten through conventional farming. But since starting to farm regeneratively, he's noticed that his soil is a lot healthier and his crops a lot more resistant to pests and extreme weather, such as floods and droughts. He's also seeing some savings. In terms of the regenerative, it's a lot more work in the fall because you're adding a whole, lot, a whole nother planting season. But in the spring, it's a lot less work. In the spring, we used to run a disc, a plow, and then a land finisher, and then the planters. Now we run the planter and that's it. It's offset a lot of our diesel costs, it's offset a lot of tractor costs, it's offset a lot of tillage costs. All that stuff is expensive, so it actually is a much more efficient way to farm. It just, there's, it, it adds a lot of complexity. Initially, he'll begin farming regeneratively to a piece of local environmental groups who were worried about runoff from farms polluting the Chesapeake Bay. Plus, Maryland has one of the most robust cover crop incentive programs in the country. Right now we get between, I think it's roughly 45 or $50 an acre to do cover crops. But Hill is also generating revenue from selling credits through Nori, a small carbon marketplace based in Seattle. Lately, there's been an explosion of private marketplaces like Nori and Indigo Ag. Here, companies and individuals eager to offset their own footprints can purchase carbon credits from farmers who've sequestered CO2. But some are skeptical that companies will use the markets as an excuse to continue business as usual. Still, McKinsey estimates that the market for carbon credits could be worth over $50 billion in 2030. The Biden administration has also earmarked $30 billion to help pay farmers to implement sustainable practices and capture carbon in their soil. Part of these funds could be used to create a federal carbon bank, which would stabilize the price of carbon. Okay, 10-4. Well, we can go ahead and do it then. Last year, Hill became the first farmer in the country to sell carbon credits through Nori. Currently, Nori offers its farmers $15 for every metric ton of CO2 that they sequester. We put in all of our data for the farm, what our yields were, our planting dates, what our cover crops are, what our cover crop plant dates are, when our cover crop was killed, all of these different things, and we put it into a model that was developed by the Department of Agriculture. What it ended up being is about a ton of carbon per year per acre. Hill says his farm already keeps records of most of the data required by the carbon sequestration model, which made the process easier. But not every farm does. And keeping track of all this data can eat up valuable time. We didn't do every field. It's a lot of work to get the model done. Um, so we took a portion of what we farm and sold that into the carbon markets. 
After paying a third-party auditor $4,000 to verify Harborview's data, Hill has so far made around $210,000 for sequestering just over 14,000 metric tons of carbon over the course of five years. So that's compost, and it's basically turning into really awesome soil. Lauren Poncha owns Stemple Creek Ranch in Northern California. Through a partnership with the Marin Carbon Project, a consortium of independent agricultural institutions, Poncha has also adopted a number of regenerative farming practices. These include applying compost instead of chemical fertilizers to pastures to avoid tilling, and periodically moving livestock from one pasture to another, thus giving the grass and soil a chance to recover. We're part of this study, a 10-year study, that had a 35-acre treatment plot and basically what we're seeing is we sequester about three to 5,000 pounds of, of carbon per acre per year. Poncha has already received state funding from California's Healthy Soils program to implement sustainable farming practices on his ranch, but says he's not yet ready to sell carbon credits on the private market because of the high cost of determining how much carbon is contained in his soil. The carbon that we're putting in the soil has allowed us to grow so much more forage that we are making more money now or selling more pounds of protein now than we did 10 years ago, but we haven't gotten to the point where we're selling carbon credits to the open market, mostly because the value of the carbon credits isn't really worth going through all of the process of monitoring and measuring in order to pay for them. Current carbon market for pasture-based carbon sequestration is somewhere between $5 and $10 per carbon credit, and in order for me to get interested, I would be, you know, more like $80 or $100 a carbon credit. Hill and Poncha agree that regenerative farming has been beneficial for soil health and their businesses. But the jury is still out on how effective the practices are when it comes to mitigating climate change. For one, setting up a carbon market is tricky because measuring carbon sequestration is hard. Back in the 1990s, there was something called the Chicago Climate Exchange, which was trying to trade carbon credits from farmers with companies who were very early on talking about greenhouse gas pollution. And the idea was back then we thought farmers who didn't till their landscape, who didn't plow it up every fall, would be absorbing carbon. They do in the top few inches of the soil. Um, but then when we started measuring the lower parts of the soil, we noticed that they weren't accumulating carbon as much and it kind of became a wash. I mean, the whole idea of that market kind of fell apart. Even today, figuring out how much carbon is trapped in the soil is not an exact science. The traditional method is you, you take a core, you stick a big kind of um, pole in the ground and pull up a, like what's basically a long rod filled with soil. And you take that out and you actually stick it in a really hot oven, essentially, and you bake out the water. But then eventually you bake out all the organic matter, you burn it all off and measure the CO2 that comes out. That's really time consuming, expensive. And you basically get a measurement for the place you stuck the pole in the ground. So you have to then go do that again and again and again across the farm because every little patch of land is a little bit different. The other option is to use an algorithm. Sometimes what we do is we rely on an algorithm that says, well, based on the topography, the basic soil kind of chemistry of where you are, the climate where you are, and the way you're farming, I'm gonna go look at a hundred other farms who did something similar and give you like a, a ballpark number to use as kind of a baseline to credit the carbon that you're putting away. Assuming that you get an accurate number for how much CO2 has been stored, the next challenge is ensuring that the CO2 will remain in the soil long term. In America, a lot of farmland isn't owned, it's leased by the farmers. And so there's turnover. So I think as a policymaker, members of Congress, the Biden administration and so on, if they're going to plan to kind of pay farmers to do this, or if companies pay farmers to do this in some kind of market, how are you paying them to ensure it'll be there for the next hundred years? Nori demands that sellers on its marketplace sign a 10-year contract, promising that they will continue farming regeneratively. So in Nori's market, the farmers are signing a 10-year contract with us that says that they're obligated to keep that carbon in the ground and they have to re-verify the data that, that we're using for quantification at least every three years. And then at every three-year verification mark, they can sign a new 10-year contract such a long commitment can be tough for farmers. As a farmer, that's a huge risk. If we get a hurricane in the fall, say September, and I have to harvest after 22 inches of rain, I'm probably gonna have to do some tillage, at least in places. What if I don't own the land? The owners that I rent from, it's not typical to get a 10-year agreement because as the markets fluctuate, so, so do the rental prices. I have some owners that, that don't like this look, right? You know, it's their farms and they like it to look neat and clean, and this is definitely 
a different look than a, than a freshly plowed field. And Hill is not alone. According to the latest numbers from the USDA, around 40% of the farmland in the U.S. was rented in 2014. Hill says challenges like these are why he's only sold about 35% of his fields into the carbon market. The biggest cost, of course, is time. If farmers have to switch the way they're doing things from what they used to do for years, which reliably could give them productivity and income, and have to make some adjustments, during that time, you might not be earning very much. Or it may take time for the farm, the ranch, to shift to getting into, kind of settling into these new practices. So that's probably why it would be good to see things like price supports and government assistance for these kinds of agriculture. Coming up with accurate measures of carbon sequestration and figuring out how to keep that CO2 in the soil long term are moot points, unless farmers agree to adopt regenerative practices in the first place. Nori currently only has six farmers who are fully enrolled onto its marketplace, and Foley estimates that regenerative farming is still only practiced on less than 1% of the farmland in the U.S. In order to gain wider adoption, Hill and Pancha think there need to be more incentives for farmers. I think what we need to do is be able to couple markets together. So, you know, if we can sell the $15 credit on the carbon market, you know, maybe we can save another few dollars on our crop insurance. We're offsetting risk by growing crops this way. So it should save crop insurance money anyway. If the government would subsidize carbon in the soil instead of subsidizing monocrops across the, the country that we end up exporting overseas anyway, I think we could definitely gain a lot of ground very quickly. If we could make a living selling the carbon, I would love it. As for a federal carbon market, Hill says that may not be a good idea. We have to turn over so much data in order to make this marketplace valid, transparent, and true. I don't know how many farmers are gonna be comfortable turning over that level of information to the Farm Service Agency. Most experts agree that regenerative farming is beneficial and should be encouraged. But they say that it's by no means a silver bullet for solving climate change and should not be used as an excuse to continue emitting greenhouse gases in other places. If we're paying farmers to secure carbon from the atmosphere as an excuse not to turn off the dirty power plant or to stop some industrial process somewhere else, that's not a good idea. Foley thinks we should also temper expectations of just how much carbon farmers may be able to sequester. There's always going to be a, a certain limit of land or how much the soils can absorb or how fast they can absorb it. You could put a sizable amount of carbon, maybe the equivalent of a few years of our emissions back into the world's soils if we did a massive regenerative push around the world. And that's nothing to sneeze at. But again, it's not a silver bullet to climate change. The nice thing about regenerative agriculture, despite the limits of it, is that it has so many co-benefits, that it helps the soils, it helps the farms, it helps the watershed, and ultimately should make farms more productive and more resilient. But the concerns are, how big is this really? Let's be careful about the claims being made here and maybe discount them quite a bit until we're sure. Because at the end of the day, the atmosphere's balance sheet is the one that matters, not ours. Hill and Poncha believe that the success of regenerative practices may not be driven by the government or the private carbon markets. I really, truly believe that it's going to be consumers that demand it of the farmers. I think more and more consumers on a daily basis are voting with their dollars, supporting people like me and other regenerative farmers out there that are doing their best to uh, try and raise a nutrient-dense, very healthy food.